Thunder Bay has its second murder of 2023. Hundreds visit a local warming center over the weekend. And MPs return to the House of Commons. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Thunder Bay Police continue to investigate the city's second homicide of the year. It happened Saturday afternoon on Mackenzie Street and involved two local men. 33-year-old Cody Young was pronounced dead in hospital. 24-year-old Matthew James Scavarelli has been charged with second-degree murder. Mike Lang has more. First responders were dispatched to the 400 block of Mackenzie Street just after 4 p.m. on Saturday following reports of a seriously injured man. Police identified the victim as 33-year-old Cody Young. He was rushed to Thunder Bay Regional, but later succumbed to his injuries. Police quickly arrested 24-year-old Matthew James Scavarelli and charged him with second-degree murder. Detective Sergeant Jason Ryback says both men were from Thunder Bay. It is not drug-related. Again, this was uh, uh, two individuals that were known to each other. There was an interaction that occurred between the two of them at a residence. Uh, for all intents and purposes, a fight ensued spilled out to the street, uh, which resulted in Mr. Young's uh, uh, ultimate death. Ryback explained that the altercation apparently began inside Scavarelli's residence on Prince Arthur Boulevard before unraveling onto the streets, and the fatal stabbing occurred on Mackenzie Street near Pruden. Ryback credits nearby witnesses who helped identify the suspect, which allowed for city police to locate and arrest Scavarelli shortly after the incident. We get a lot of support from the community with a video, um, dash cam video. We got some dash cam video from uh, an individual in the area. Uh, so it's, it's monitoring that. It's watching the video, you know, generating those reports, generating the briefs, working with the Crown's office on moving the investigation through the court process. But Ryback is equally troubled with this already being the second murder of the new year and the second in as many weeks after 15 homicides in 2022. It's concerning the, number, the sheer number. I mean, we're, we're getting to, we're meeting with you folks every three weeks at this point to talk about the deaths in the city. And, and uh, we have to do something as a community to, 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 to solve this problem because it's, it's very taxing. Scavarelli was held in custody following his bail court hearing on Sunday as police continue to examine the scenes where the altercation occurred. The next steps in the investigation include a post-mortem and determining the motives behind the incident. Mike Lang. TVT News. More than half a million dollars in cocaine has been seized and three people arrested following a three-month investigation by an OPP-led guns and gangs team. Three search warrants were executed in Thunder Bay on January 19th. Officers with the OPP, NAPS, Anishinaabek Police and the Thunder Bay Police seized 3.7 kilograms of cocaine, $50,000 in cash and a vehicle. Two 29-year-old men from Toronto and Mississauga, as well as a 32-year-old from Quebec, remain in custody. Thunder Bay OPP dealt with a number of crashes this morning, largely due to the frost and ice that developed on local highways during the overnight deep freeze. At least five vehicles slid into ditches, and there was a multi-vehicle crash on the Thunder Bay Expressway. That happened sometime before 10 o'clock between Oliver Road and the Harbour Expressway. OPP say at least three vehicles were involved, forcing the closure of both southbound lanes. Fortunately, there were no serious injuries reported, and the expressway fully reopened around 11 o'clock. Meanwhile, OPP have now released details about a serious crash Saturday morning on the Steel River Bridge near Terrace Bay. A transport and an SUV collided, killing a 64-year-old in the SUV. Another person was taken to hospital with minor injuries. The highway was closed for most of the day Saturday as OPP investigated. The extreme cold warning issued by Environment Canada continued in Thunder Bay today with the wind, wind chill dropping to minus 36 this morning. The recent cold temperatures led to a busy weekend at local warming centres, including at Pace, which saw a large number of people in need of shelter this weekend. Between Saturday morning and Sunday afternoon, the warming centre on East Victoria Avenue saw more than 300 people come through its doors, with many dropping in more than once. Executive Director Georgina McKinnon says they were prepared in advance of the cold snap for the high demand. McKinnon insists they do have enough supplies to keep people warm, fed and comfortable, thanks to the generosity of the community.
we do have to limit what we give people sometimes so that we make sure we always have something for them. Um, we do have various very generous people in our community. The Dew Drop-In is bringing us uh, meals on a weekly and bi uh, twice a week basis. We have Team Deck uh, bringing in snacks and treats. We do have enough supplies, but we could always use more, of course. Yeah, McKinnon adds those donations are helpful and can be dropped off at the Pace office located next to the warming center. Ontario's former Lieutenant Governor David, on David Onley was remembered today at a state funeral. He was the first person with a physical disability to be appointed to the role. Onley passed away earlier this month at the age of 72. Scott Lightfoot reports. It was a procession fit for a representative of the Queen. With a military and police escort through the streets of Toronto, the casket of Ontario's 28th Lieutenant Governor arrived at this Young Street Church late this morning. David Onley was appointed to the vice regal position in 2007 and served for seven years. It's such a privilege and he knew that, he loved the job and he did his very best to make sure that he used the platform, particularly uh, for those who suffer from various disabilities. Onley was the first Lieutenant Governor with a physical disability an after effect from a childhood battle with polio. He was an activist, but he was such a decent human being and, uh, and just helped so many people in his life. Among the hundreds of attendees today, many from Queen's Park, past and present. He's a great broadcaster and a, and a sterling human being. He's just an approachable, decent human being. He spoke to, uh, to me a lot about kids and uh, growing up in Ontario, to feel everyone would be welcome. Inside the church, Onley was remembered for a number of his roles. For many Ontarians, our first memories of David were watching him in our living rooms, on the television. A former broadcaster, again breaking barriers, is the first with a physical disability to regularly appear on television in this city. If dad can do what he's done, As a disabled man, what can I do as a fully able-bodied man? Onley was also remembered as a devoted husband and father. My dad's greatest wish was for all disabled people to have the ability to fully participate in the social, cultural and economic life of Canada. Onley's legacy as an advocate for those with disabilities touched on repeatedly during the service. My present mobility challenges are small and temporary. I can't pretend to even begin to understand what David must have gone through every day. Even the minister leading today's service and currently using Onley's old mobility scooter as he recovers from surgery shared how Onley made him better understand the challenges millions face every day. At the conclusion of the service, Onley's casket was removed from the church and taken just a few meters down the road to Mount Pleasant Cemetery, leaving behind a legacy of change for those who came after him. Scott Lightfoot, CTV News. About 400 Woodlands workers with Resolute Forest products in our region have ratified a new collective agreement that includes healthy wage hikes over the next four years. The workers represented by USW Local 1 2010 will receive a 23% increase over the life of the deal along with improved benefits. Votes were held in Ignace, Dryden and Thunder Bay with more than 75% of members in support of the deal. Well, the Ford government is providing more than $68,000 to the Female Border Collective for two internships at the Cinema 5 Skate Park. Local MPP Kevin Holland was on site to make the announcement this afternoon. He says the skate park is a great project for the government to invest in. It uh, really is giving something for our community, the, the youth in our community to get involved in. It helps them to stay active uh, during the winter months when normally their sport wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't be able to practice their sport because of the winter conditions. Here. This funding is in addition to $58,000 provided by the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund last year, which helped cover 95% of the skate park's construction. The new funding will allow the nonprofit to hire a park project officer as well as a project coordinator, coordination officer. 
Board member Sterling Downey with the Female Border Collective says the funding will also help provide more youth programs at the skate park and other after-school programming as well. Between the two programs, one will be using the skateboarding for the kids who want to skateboard, but also using skateboarding to bring kids in to other activities and other interests. So somebody might be interested in skateboarding but not be great at skateboarding, but maybe they want to do a magazine, maybe they want to interview skateboarders, maybe they want to manufacture skateboards, maybe they want to make t-shirts. So all of this stuff is going to help them look in terms of entrepreneurship, inclusion, building ideas, and, and basically at the end of the day just building self-confidence. Downey adds it's all about making the Cinema 5 skate park as accessible and inclusive as possible. Canada is dealing with a major pilot shortage. The number of pilot licenses issued in the country has decreased by more than 80 percent since 2019, according to NAV Canada. Furthermore, the post-pandemic travel surge has created even more demand for flights. So to help address that, Confederation College's aviation program is giving young pilots the opportunity to make the jump to the airlines at a faster rate than ever. Mike Lang explains. Taking to the skies with Canada's main airlines used to be a decade-long process for entry-level pilots. But with the growing need for aviators across the industry, Confederation College's flight management program is now able to turn students into mainline commercial pilots within as little as a four-year span. In those first 21 months, Confederation students complete their lessons in the simulators, classroom and on Cessnas to achieve the 200 flight hours that are required for their first airline job. Program coordinator Stefan Terrien says students then typically find work immediately with local airlines upon graduating, which they can use as a step toward getting hired by larger airlines after another two years. With the local airlines, it's pretty quick, uh, and then they're pretty quick to get onto a plane, even though if they might be loading bags for a couple of months. Uh, and then that gives them a chance to get checked out and do some groundwork and some practice with the new plane, and then they'll go and fly. Um, after that, it all depends on, on what the industry is looking for. Usually 500 hours, 750 hours. When you start to get to that range, um, then you might get taken in by one of the airlines. The pilot shortage has prompted the Canadian government to invest close to $5 million into Confederation College's aviation program in 2022. But the college is also helping to address another significant shortage in the industry, that being the need for more aviation mechanics. We got companies calling us to say how many grads you got, can we come do a presentation, we need people. So there's more and more companies doing that where years and years ago, they, they didn't do that kind of stuff. The student had to go find their own jobs. Now, a lot of the companies are coming to us. Greer says the two-year program teaches students to perform maintenance on all aircraft parts, and they've recently added a co-op component after first year, where students can work a paid position in the industry. So between all the job openings, government subsidies, and the quick turnaround from student to employee, there's more incentive than ever to begin a career in aviation. Mike Lang, TBT News. The city's Winter Fun Days series continued yesterday afternoon despite the cold. This time attendees were able to go on a scenic dog sled ride in the park behind Current River Arena. Jessica Clement was there. Boreal Journey's sled dog kennel were the ones who brought in their dogs for an afternoon of fun. And despite the freezing cold, kids and their parents lined up for the chance to go on a dog sledding ride. Families were able to meet the dog sledding team and their owners, learn how mushers control their dogs, and while they were waiting, warm up by the bonfire. Boreal Journeys provided dog sledding rides at last year's Winter Fun Day series, and owner Paula Mano says the response is always great. People have been in, engaging us in our, in, and our dogs. It's been, it's been nice. People have been really uh, excited to meet our dogs and, and to give them lots of love, and that's wonderful for our dogs. And yeah, we got here and People were here waiting for us, so it's nice to see people out. It's a, it's a great, it's a great. You know, the weather is perfect for this kind of activity. Um, again, yeah, it's nice to see people out. The event consisted of two sleds and four dogs per team, and everyone got a chance to ride around the field at least once. The weather made it a little tough, however, as the wind was blowing snow onto the pre-made track. The wind drifted it in a little bit, so in those parts, the dogs and the and the mushers too are are running to push it through the through the snow where it's drifted, and then the rest of the part 
we're flying around pretty pretty good. The dogs have been really happy today. It's nice and cool for them so they can keep their energy up all day. The new experience was a hit with the kids, and we asked them what their favorite part of the activity was. Well, I've been seeing like the movies, and I'm like really excited. And then it just looks super fun. They run really fast. To go uh, so dogs can pull you. That they go off course. Next week's Winter Fun Day will be a Disney costume DJ skating party at the Marina Park Skating Rink from 2 to 4 p.m. You can find more information about the rest of the Winter Fun Day's programming on the city's website. Jessica Clement, TBT News. Well, Fiona, as fun as that looks, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are hoping that uh, the temperatures are a little warmer for those Winter Fun Days moving forward. Well, we can hope. <laughs> it <laughs> certainly is not looking good thus far, considering uh, it just has been getting progressively cold, colder each day throughout the weekend and kicking off uh, the new week in what could only be referred to as brutally cold, because as we heard earlier in the newscast, uh, we did hit wind chills of minus 36 overnight and uh, stayed pretty close to that in the early morning hours. We did warm up to a high of minus 18, but that's actually a little closer to what we should be seeing at nighttime. And with winds gusting up to 41 kilometers per hour from the west, wind chills have been hovering around minus 29 this afternoon in the city uh, under mostly to partly sunny skies. Now, uh, actually minus 18, that's pretty much one of the milder locations in the region, unfortunately. Uh, to the west in Fort Francis, they saw wind chills hit minus 44 overnight. It has been warming up all day. They are currently at their daytime high of minus 21 and a wind chill of minus 30. And that trend continues up into Kenora, Dryden, and up into Red Lake where they've been having a drifting snow with all the wind. They too have a wind chill of minus 30 at this hour. Eastward into Sioux Lookout and Armstrong, they're at minus 22, minus 26 in Greenstone. They saw wind chills hit minus 43 last night, so brutally cold there. Right now, the wind chill is hovering around minus 35. Now, along the North Shore, similar temperatures, minus 20 in Nipigon, minus 19 in Marathon. Sioux St. Marie has seen their temperatures uh, drop uh, for much of the day. They're currently at minus 6 and uh, a low of, or sorry, minus 6 and a wind chill of uh, minus 13 at this hour. Now, for the city of Thunder Bay, the extreme cold warning continues as it does for most of the region. We're going to drop down to a low of minus 26 and wind chills are going to hit minus 35 overnight under clear skies. And unfortunately, the uh, cold temperatures are going to continue. We've got very cold air through uh, the north, northern states and into Ontario and Manitoba. And we're not going to be out of it uh, for at least another 24 to 36 hours. I'll have more details when uh, we will see a slight break. It's later on in the news hour. Okay, well, we were spoiled for a long time this winter, Fiona. We knew a it had to month. come eventually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, federal MPs returned to the House of Commons today. We'll tell you which discussion points were top of mind as your news hour continues. The conservative leader stands up, crosses his arms, throws up his hands, and says, Everything is broken.
MPs returned to the House of Commons today. Health care and the economy were at the forefront of the debates on day one of the new session. Annie Bergeron-Oliver has the latest from Ottawa. Questions. After a six-week break, Parliament is back in session. After eight years of this Prime Minister, we have 40-year highs in inflation. We have 32% increase in crime. The Conservative leader stands up, crosses his arms, throws up his hands and says, everything is broken. Well, that's not what Canadians are living through, Mr. Speaker. The square off on inflation setting the stage for a political season likely to be dominated by the affordability crisis, especially with a federal budget looming. For the Liberals, they can't make a mistake. Because if they make a mistake on the one side, they'll have Pierre Poilier pick up support. And then if they don't do enough, they'll be facing Jugmeet Singh and the New Democrats, who you know will put the squeeze on the Liberals to help and to spend. Health care also a major priority. Next week, the Premiers will be in Ottawa to meet with the Prime Minister and hopefully hammer out deals on health care and a funding increase. The fundamental thing that we want to see in this deal is that we solve the health care crisis that we're in. And... The deal will be a failure if it doesn't include major commitments to hire more health care workers. Half of Canadians are struggling to find a family doctor and about 6 million do not have one at all. Catherine Thompson is one of those statistics. For the last six years, she's been driving at least an hour and a half to see a doctor because she can't find one in her home city of Oshawa. It would be much easier to have care nearby and build that relationship with your family physician that we're just not able to do because we can't find that access to care. In a statement issued today, the premiers reiterated their expectation that the federal government increase health transfers to 35 percent, despite indications that the prime minister isn't looking for a one-size-fits-all approach. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. The World Health Organization says COVID-19 continues to be a public health emergency of international concern. In the past eight weeks, more than 170,000 people have lost their lives to COVID-19. The head of the UN Health Agency says COVID-19 is probably at a transition point, but remains a dangerous infectious disease. It also continues to pose a threat to personal health and healthcare systems. The organization says it's hopeful the next year will see a reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. British Columbia has detailed a three-year pilot program that will see small quantities of illicit drugs decriminalized. As of tomorrow, drug users 18 and older will be allowed to carry a combined 2.5 grams of opioids such as heroin, morphine and fentanyl, as well as cocaine, methamphetamine and MDMA, also known as ecstasy. BC's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Bonnie Henry, has pushed for decriminalization, saying it'll be one major step toward eliminating the stigma that drug users face. Today's announcement will, is an important step to help remove the fear and the shame and that stigma and allows people to have open conversations that we can um, help people understand their drug use and reach out for the services they need. We hope this will help people feel safer about getting those life-saving services and programs and talking to their friends, talking to their health care provider, and help our health care system in keeping people alive and connected to the health and social supports they need. Back in our province, the city of Mississauga is remembering a giant in Canadian politics. Former Mayor Hazel McCallion passed away Sunday at the age of 101. Known affectionately as Hurricane Hazel, she served as the city's mayor from 1978 until, 19, until 2014. Sean Lethong reports. Writing a message to remember Hazel McCallion, many residents lining up to sign a book of condolence in Mississauga City Hall. My family uh, immigrated to the first place we came to since immigrating to Canada was Mississauga. And um, growing up, Hazel was my mayor from childhood till my university years. She, uh, she was my role model since I was 12. McCallion died Sunday at the age of 101. Quinny Chuan says despite her high profile, the longtime mayor of Mississauga was known for her personal touch, even coming to Chuan's wedding in 2010. I remember when she walked into the, the, the reception room at my wedding, suddenly whoosh, the whole room went quiet. Suddenly all the cameras flash, 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 nonstop. 
because everybody was like, oh my gosh, Hazel's in the room. With a message to her mentor, current Mississauga Mayor Bonnie Crombie takes time to remember Hazel McCallion. She is the architect of our city. She built the city. What, where we stand today, 50 years ago, was farmland and fruit trees. And we are an economic powerhouse today. Crombie becoming mayor after McCallion stepped down in 2014. And Crombie fondly remembers her meeting with McCallion before running to replace her. I remember that call to my office that Hazel McCallion, the mayor wants to see you. Honestly, that walk down the hallway I felt like I was going into the principal's office. <laughs> I felt like I was eight years old being taken into the principal's office for some misdeed and I was shaking in my boots, thought, oh no, what did I do wrong? I'm going to be dressed down by Hazel, who takes every opportunity to dress down prime ministers and premiers, ministers of the government. Now it was my turn, a lowly counselor on her team. But actually, she announced to me that she was going to retire and she encouraged me to put my name forward on the ballot. Shantley Thong, CTV News. Well, turning to the U.S. now, Memphis police say a sixth officer has been disciplined but not fired following the death of Tyree Nichols. The department says Officer Preston Hemphill was relieved from duty shortly after the January 7th arrest and brutal beatdown of Nichols, who died three days later in hospital. Five other officers were fired and faced second-degree murder and kidnapping charges. The battle for eastern Ukraine continues. At least five people have been killed in the latest Russian attack. NBC's Raf Sanchez has the latest on the ground and on Kyiv's pleas for more weapons. Ukrainian civilians still under fire from Russian forces today. Authorities in Ukraine say both the cities of Kherson and Kharkiv targeted by Russian troops overnight. In Kherson, a hospital ward was hit by Russian artillery, according to local...